Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is a Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. Over the past year, we've had several guests on the show who've gone through incredible levels of abuse during their childhood. Wes Chapman being one and today's guest, JT McCormick being another. As a child, JT was sexually abused for years. Having mixed race parents, he was always the outcast no matter where he went. And he spent most of his youth either homeless or in juvenile detention. By all predictive measures, JT should have ended up dead or in prison, but he did not. He got his first job sorting mail for nationwide insurance. From there, he quickly worked his way up the ladder, and within a few years, he was offered a regional vice president position at another firm, and then landed at a software company called Headspring. Within two years, he was promoted to president of the company, and Headspring was listed as one of the top places to work for the next three years in a row here in Texas. Well, today, JT's career has brought him much closer to home when my friend and fellow self-made man guest, Tucker Max, brought him on as the CEO of Book in a Box. Now, as you'll hear in today's interview, they are achieving record growth under his leadership. And what I'm absolutely fascinated by is how people like Wes and JT have managed to turn around an abusive nightmare of a childhood into fuel for an extraordinary life of achievement. Ultimately, they must have made a conscious decision to pursue a better path, to choose empowerment instead of victimhood and service instead of perpetuating a cycle of abuse. Well, today we're going to dive into JT's story and discover that moment and the decisions that he's made that have changed his life. Both of them are living examples of the fact that your past does not determine your future and that you are only one decision away from changing your destiny. And ultimately, that is what self-made man is all about. As we state in our mission on the homepage, a man or woman becomes self-made the moment they decide to shape their world rather than be shaped by it. It's a moment, it's a spark, it's a decision, it's an internal will that can never be given by another and that can never be purchased or borrowed. And in that moment, you become the sole architect and artist of your life, a self-made man where the rest of the world serves as the hammer and chisel you wield in order to shape it to your desire. Well, my personal mission is to provide you with the inspiration to make that choice in your life and then support you with the knowledge and skills that you need to execute it successfully. This Monday, February 5th, a new chapter begins for Self-Made Man as we launch the largest learning platform that has ever been built just for entrepreneurs. If you haven't done so yet, I'd like to invite you to go to selfmademan.com and subscribe to our newsletter so that you'll get an invitation to participate in our pre-launch contest where we're going to be giving away over $35,000 in cash and prizes. And one of you... Yes, that could definitely be you. We'll walk away with a brand new home office and $15,000 in cash or Bitcoin. So with that being said, I will see you this Monday for the big announcement. And without further ado, please welcome JT McCormick. Well, JT, it's an absolute pleasure to finally have you on the show. I'm super excited about today. Mr. Mike Dillard, thank you for having me, sir. Absolute brother. So uh, you and I had a chance to briefly uh, get to meet gosh, probably six, seven months ago through our mutual friend, Cameron Harold, And obviously, we've been a, a big supporter of uh, Tucker, and he's been here on the show a couple of times uh, also. But when we had dinner with Cameron, I had a chance to hear about your story, which literally blew everybody away at the table <laughs> that we were eating dinner at. And I was just like, holy smokes, this is absolutely amazing. I've got to get JT on the show to... Uh, share his lessons learned and, and frankly, the example that you've you've given others throughout uh, the life that you've lived and, and the leader that you've become. So for those who are not familiar with JT, get ready for just a hell of a, a hell of a show and an opportunity to learn. So thanks again for being here. Uh, with that being said, I would love it if you would share the story uh, with our audience today that you shared with us that evening. Mike, I appreciate you having me on. In- incredibly humbled and-, and flattered to to be here and-, and tell the story. So, gosh, where where do I start? I'll, I'll take it back early, and you you ask questions. I'll dive into the details. My 
My father was a black pimp and drug dealer in the 1970s. And when, when I say that, I, I always follow it up with letting people know that my father was a true pimp. He put women on a corner, they sold their bodies, they made their money, and they brought it back to my father. And why that's important is because our society, somewhere along the line, turned the word pimp into a positive. And it's far from a, a positive from where I come from. And my mother uh, was a white woman or is a white woman, and she was raised in an orphanage in the 1950s, old school institutional orphanage. When she turned 17 years old, they gave her $20, her suitcase, and said, good luck to you. There's the world. And she had never seen the outside of those four walls. So that is what I was born into. And here I am. I, I've, grown, I've gone through everything from sexual abuse to being raised mixed race in the 70s, which was not cool whatsoever. Black people didn't like you because you were half black or half white. White people didn't like you because you were half black. So I, I had an identity problem. I had nowhere to fit in. And it was hell on, on my mother having a mixed race son. And and I really, I, I recall one of the most harsh memories that my mother dealt with was when I was five, we are coming home on the bus and we're, we're headed to our apartment. And as we get closer, we see all our belongings on the curb. And as we get there, we we're wondering, well, what the hell's going on? And the landlord comes running out of the, the uh, apartment complex and he gets right in my mother's face. And he says, no nigger lovers can live here. And I remember at five years old saying to myself, wow, we have no money, no family, and nowhere to go. What are we going to do? And we sat on the curb, and I remember crying with my mother. And to this day, I don't know where we went or what we did, but I just remember that that moment. So, yeah, harsh background, harsh upbringing. Childhood was, was pretty brutal. I grew up on welfare. I've eaten food out of trash cans because I knew there was no food at, at home uh, when, when I got home from school. Uh, you know, wore bread bags on my feet because we had holes in our shoes. So yeah, it, it's, I know for me, I make a light of it. I know it's a harsh story, but I went through it. It's behind me. And so for me, everything is going forward. How do I succeed now? Because I can't change the past. How did you make the decision at some point in your childhood not to see yourself as a victim and to take a more positive outlook on your future? Because the fact that you were able to do that is unbelievably rare, right? So I'm just curious as to when that happened, if you can remember specifically, if it was a, a, an individual, a mentor, a book. But somebody inspired you to, to take a brighter you know, look at your future. So how did that work out? You, you know, I, it, I've, I've often sat back and thought, okay, what was a, a moment that I can define where things really changed for me? And if you want to go into the, to the details of how I got there, just, just let me know. But when we were in Houston, my father took me through a neighborhood called uh, River Oaks. So it, whatever city you're in, think of the most exclusive neighborhood. That's what River Oaks is to, to Houston. Uh, you've got the, the, the oil money that's there, uh, a lot of old generational money that, that's there. And my father drove me through that neighborhood. And I remember seeing 10, 15, $25 million homes where one family lived there. And the homes were bigger than the the projects that I lived in. And, and I remember saying to myself, I want that. And it was the first time I had ever seen what was possible. And so before that, all I ever saw was Dayton, Ohio. I, I saw drug addiction. I saw pimps and prostitutes. I saw you know, welfare, standing in line for food stamps. All I saw was the, the, the poor side of society. I had never seen anything like that. And that was a defining moment for me at 10 years old. And I said, okay, I want one of those. And if I had to go back anywhere, that would be the moment where things changed for me. So take us through, you know, the point in your life where you're becoming a young adult, you've got the ability to essentially move out, uh, get a job. 
what was that period in your life like? Wow. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take you through, through, uh, graduating high school real fast. Cause that's where the, the first job really came was, was after summer school. So I, I never graduated uh, high school. Truth be told, when I got to San Antonio at 15, I was a sophomore and they put me in a class called geometry and Mike, I didn't, I, it was the first time I'd ever even heard the word geometry and I didn't say anything when they were registering me. So I went and I sat in this class and for six weeks, Mike, I didn't know what the hell was going on. And so after the six weeks, everyone realized, okay, this kid's not too bright. And so they tested me and here I was 15 years old, sophomore in high school, but I was only testing on a fifth or sixth grade level. So obviously to say graduation rolls around. I don't have enough credits to, to graduate. So I didn't get to walk the stage and, and all that good stuff with, with my, my friends in, uh, in, in high school. So I had to go to summer school to get my high school diploma. So I go to summer school. I finish everything up. And I asked the uh, administration, I said, okay, how do I get my high school diploma? And they said, okay, you got to go back to your, your high school and – get your diploma. So I'm excited. I'm thinking, okay, confetti's about to come out of the air. I'm, I'm graduating in high school. I show up. There's two cars in the parking lot. I go into the building. Long story short, the janitor gave me my high school diploma. And so uh, no confetti, no celebration, just here's your piece of paper. Good luck to you. And so I get home and my mother immediately tells me, uh, okay, great. You graduated high school. Go get a job. And she said, you got two weeks. And so I found a job at a restaurant of all places. So we, I had grown up poor my, my whole life. It's so much so my mother and I used to joke that we were so poor, we couldn't afford the O and the R. We were just Poe. And so <laughs> I, of all the places I could have gotten a job, I got a job at a restaurant called Poe Folks. <laughs> and so my my responsibility was to come in at nine o'clock each morning i work from nine to three each day i clean the restrooms from the night before and i bust the tables and wash dishes that was my first job into society if you will you know you've really excelled at at every career you've had as an adult and we'll get into those those here in a little bit and I'm just curious as to where you learned the work ethic and the value set that has allowed you to do that. You know, combination of things. It, 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 and if you will give me a, a minute here, a part of it for me, Mike, is many people keep a victim mentality of what happened to them in life. And that's the reason why they've not moved forward. I took all of the what happens to what happened to me in life and I've used them as what lesson can I take from that? And I'll give you a very a good one for me here. It's a harsh ass story. I, I one of the few weekends my father picked me up. We were at the grocery store. We're walking down the frozen food aisle, and I was in fourth grade, nine years old. I, I clear as day can remember this. Little girl walks by and she says, "Hi, Javon." Javon's my my real name, and I didn't say anything. I just put my head down. And I remember this massive blow to the back of my head and I fall down, I bust my nose, my nose is bleeding. The next thing I know, I'm, I'm pulled up by my shirt and I've got a forearm under my neck and I'm, I'm up against the, the frozen food door. And my father looks at me and he says, I don't care who it is. You speak to everyone. Now, that's a harsh lesson. But to this day, Mike, I speak to everyone. And so I took the lesson and I've made it, uh, I've turned it into a career, if you will, that I, I say hello to everyone. And truth be told, I'm probably nicer to service industry people than C-suite executives. They, they've got enough people kissing their ass. They don't need me, you know, one more. So uh, yeah, I say hello to everyone. And those little moments like that for me are where I took the work ethic, the things, what can I take from the moment? You know, my dad, you have to have a sharp tongue and you have to be pretty damn good if you can convince a woman to go stand on a corner, sell herself and give you all the money. And so I paid attention to my dad. I listened to him. 
I watched my mom. She did everything she possibly could do to, to feed me from sweeping out the stairwells in the, in the project so we could get $10 off of our rent, eating lima beans and splitting them with me so we could have something to eat. So I always took every harsh lesson and I've turned it into how can I make my life better or make that lesson work for me? Yeah, I mean, that's just that's awesome. And it's just so rare for someone to experience, you know, things like that and to have the the foresight and the wisdom to turn them into a, a positive example and outlet, right? Other than doing what most people do, which is to follow in those footsteps, right? Crime begets crime and you know, yeah. values beget values. And I, I just think that that's so awesome that you manage to somehow, again, have the wisdom to see the difference between the two and to make a conscious decision about that. And there's opportunities around us every day, you know, for people listening to the show or one degree of separation who have young kids or, you know, teenagers who are in that position, right? They're, they're trying to make decisions that will ultimately <laughs> determine the fate of the rest of their life. And, um, I just think that's just such an amazing example. So after your your first job, the experiences there, the lessons that you learned there, you really started to build a career for yourself that you know has ultimately led in you becoming the CEO of a couple of different companies now, most recently Book in a Box. And you guys are just growing like crazy. So if you could take us through the progression of your business career and how you've really you know, learned leadership and learned how to effectively uh, build the team and build the company as you've done here for the last, you know, 10, 20 years. So for me, Mike, again, everything's been, been lessons. There was no role model. There was no one who pointed these things out to me or, or put me on the right path. Everything I've taken from, from lessons. So my, my first job at corporate America was nationwide insurance. And I remember this, this, uh, he was a vice president and I used to always watch him one because it was one of the first times I had ever seen a black guy in a suit that wasn't a pimp. And so <laughs> it, it, when I would watch him, I noticed every time someone said, Hey, how are you? He would always say tremendous. And so I said, huh? He's tremendous. Every time someone asks me how I am, I'm going to say excellent. If you notice, when you and I first got on the phone, I said I was excellent. So everything for me has been how do I learn? Where can I get this information? How can I progress in my career? What can I do? I always want to know who's the number one at whatever role uh, I'm in. So that that leadership came from just a series of Hell, truth be told, my failures, uh, you know, when, when I was at the software company, that's where I really learned how to be a leader, because before that, I was all about self. I only knew how to get through life for me, because it, it was a struggle. I, where I come from, it was, okay, get your ass out of here and, and, and try to make a better way. So at the software company, I, I remember it clear as day, Mike. I got promoted to to president. So I'll give you the story. I started, I was employee number 13, and I was the lowest paid person in the company. I was the sales guy. And so we made our calls on fold-out metal chairs, and I, I, le I taught myself, okay, enterprise software, what's that consist of? I had never sold that shit. I didn't know what the enterprise software was, but I, I called competitors, I learned, so on and so forth. Fast forward, did a decent job, obviously, got promoted to president within three years. But I remember the day when I was president, everything was on me now. And I realized, oh, I can't do this by myself. You can only scale yourself so far. You need people in business. You have to have others around you who are smarter in order to be a, a great leader. And one of the early things for me in leadership was I learned that, oh, I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. And in fact, I don't ever want to be the smartest person in the room because shit, if, if we're ever in a room together and I'm the smartest one in there, man, we're all effed up. So it, it's, 
I learned early on at the software company that you need people to, to succeed. Yeah, and, you know, that's, uh, that's a tough skill to learn. I know it's been a challenge for me. How did you and Tucker meet? Because I've heard the story from him, but I'd love to hear it from your perspective as well. <laughs> so I, I, I'm at the software company and it, it, was, it was a great run. I, I loved it. Phenomenal people around me, some of the smartest people I'd ever been around. And Q3 of 2015 came around and I was traveling a lot. And I said, okay. If something happened to me, my children would not know where I came from. They would know that we don't know where our last name came from. My, my mother was given the last name McCormick in the uh, orphanage, but she has no clue where the name came from or why they even gave it to her. So I had this last name that I cannot tell you where it comes from. So it was important for me that I wanted to leave a legacy for my children. I've always been fascinated by like the Ford family that can go five generations deep. I, I can't go 30 minutes deep. And so I, I wanted to leave that legacy piece. So I reached out to my, my LinkedIn network and I said, hey, does anyone know how I, how I can do a book? Got introduced to Tucker and Zach. Tucker comes over to my office. We sit down and say, look, I don't even know if this is a book. I gave him part of the story and he looks at me like, you know, what the F? And so... As we're wrapping up, Tucker says to me, hey, can you give me feedback on our company as you go through the process? And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. And he thought I was just BSing him, being nice. But I get my first email from Book in a Box, and I call up Tucker, and I said, hey, do you still want this feedback? And he says, oh, yeah, definitely. I said, okay, great. I don't sugarcoat. I go pretty hard. And he's like, give it to me. I said, okay, this, this is great. This is great. Keep doing this this over here why the hell did you even start this this sucks and what were you thinking here and he said you got all that from an email i go yeah why he goes would you like to sit on our advisory board <laughs> and so <laughs> I, I said yes you know let's uh, i'll sit on your advisory board then i got invited to uh one of their executive meetings lo and behold i wake up one day and i'm the ceo of book in the box so walk us through, because I know Tucker's talked about this openly, and I, you know, I just don't think he would give a damn if you talked about it. But Tucker, when y'all were going through this process, you know, became very self-aware of his shortcomings and what he needed to learn, and that you were much more experienced when it came to essentially the CEO position. And that's not an easy thing to do or to admit. And I remember he wrote a series of, of blog posts about this that were, were fantastic. But could you share us, uh, share a little bit about that process with us as far as, you know, hey, I've got a founder and he's willing to give me the reins essentially of his company. What was that process like? You know, Mike, and, and help me out here for, for a second. And I'll go into some, some details. What I have found, what I find actually amazing or sometimes I'm actually uh, dumbstruck by it is that so many times people are on podcast or they're interviewed and everyone talks about the the success and everyone talks about what they've done. I, I'm a big proponent of I've learned the things that I have by way of what didn't work or you know wh where did I, I come up short or what misstep. I don't say failures because I believe you only fail if you stop trying. So I, I don't ever fail because I don't ever stop trying, but I have had some missteps and I have had some things that didn't work out in, in my favor at the time. And one of those is when I first started with Zach and Tucker, I was a CEO of a company that had two co-founders, one co-founder who has had a, an immense amount of, of fame and success and another co-founder who was a or is a 27-year-old millennial. So you have a huge dynamic there. And I, I've always given them respect for this. There are not too many people wired in a new founded company that are willing to say, OK, we can't do this. We got to give it to somebody else. Most people in, when, with new companies, they're, they're tied up with their, their ego. They want the title, the you know, CEO, and Tucker's talked about this. Do you want a CEO title or do you want a great company? So for me, one of the missteps that I made early on is I treated them 
as co-founder prima donnas. Oh, well, they're the, they're the co-founders. And truth be told, they wanted me to come in, be the CEO and say, okay, we're doing this, 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 and this. In every other aspect of the company, that's exactly what I did. But I didn't always do it with the co-founders. And it took about nine months for me to finally say, okay, this is how this is going down. This is what you brought me in for. And here's what we're going to do. So it was a, a hell of a dynamic. And it was interesting to uh, watch it play out. And, and I'll, I'll quote Tucker. Tucker says he does not believe that there is anyone else in the world who could actually come in and be a CEO of the company he founded just because of how demanding he is. It, it takes a certain type of person to push back on Tucker. Yeah, no, exactly. That's why I think it's such a, a special situation and story that I had to hear the details behind because, you know, it, it takes a lot for him to, to trust someone. Uh, and to hand over the reins of the business like that to you, just, I mean, there is no bigger compliment, right? So I just think that's really awesome. Now, with that being said, you guys have been growing like crazy, right? So take us through some metrics, whatever you're willing to share as far as how the company's been growing the last couple of years. Let's talk about, you know, what you and I mentioned uh, before the show as far as your offices and the transitions that you're going through there. Uh, to give people some context. And then if we could, let's dive into why it's been working. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with the story you and I talked about before we, we jumped on. So when I first joined the, the, the company, the company was based out of uh, Tucker's penthouse uh, here in Austin. <laughs> and so that's where we started. We outgrew that. And so we ended up moving to WeWork. 90 days into our first office at WeWork, we had to move to a bigger WeWork office. And then nine months after that, we had to finally move into our own office where, where we are now. And we're, we're in the same building here in Austin as, as Uber. So we, we've grown quite a bit. We've worked with over 650 authors now. It's probably a little higher, but we'll, we'll just go with 650. And this, this is real important. And, and I share this with, with people with a little bit of a uh, – I call it confidence. Some people may say it's a, a tad bit of, of arrogance, but we are a three-year-old company. We have no debt, no loans, no private equity money, and no venture capital money. And most important, we actually have a profitable bottom line. So all of that mythical valuation bullshit that, that people preach, we actually can show you a bottom line and we're a three-year-old company. Yeah. I mean, that's to me, how it should be done. <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly. Exactly. Where, where, where did that go? Where the, the, the metrics started being number of subscribers and, and uh, you know, how, how fast we can raise. I, I've never understood oh, yeah. this. Like, it, well, it's like the, the, win, the winning metric is, hey, how much debt do you have and how much company yes. did you give of your company did you give away? All right. right. Congratulations. You, you, yeah. You just said it. I, this one blows me away. Be it Austin Business Journal, Dallas, Houston, na name your big city. I've always been blown away when you open it up and it'll show XYZ company just raised series F and there's two pictures of the co-founders in there and they're smiling and I'm going why are you smiling you just gave away more of your company and you're on series F how far down the line are you going <laughs> right. right right exactly you know it's it's all it is is at the end of the day, I mean, it's a vote of confidence, right? Okay, somebody's willing to give you money. There's at least some level of confidence in, in your ability that they have. But that's just, you know, a stroke of the ego. And at the end of the day, you're, they still don't have their money back, right? And, and that's what exactly. it's ultimately about. So couldn't agree with you more. So what's some of the biggest pieces of advice you could share with everybody listening when it comes to growing a startup and making that transition successfully, right? Building a team managing expenses, managing customer acquisition. Is there a secret methodology or sauce essentially, you know, that you've utilized over there, Book in a Box? You know, I, I've always, if I say one thing, know your numbers, know your company. And when I say numbers, I don't just mean as far as your, your financials. Yes, that's very important. You got to know your, your financials. But how many authors does it take each month to make sure that we're, we're hitting our targets. How many authors are in 
this part of the process. Know your numbers, know your company. You don't know your numbers, you don't know your company. And that's that's probably the biggest factor of the, the company operational standpoint. From a people piece, I would say culture. In fact, we hire for culture fit first, skill set second, meaning that we believe if you have if you're a culture fit, we can help coach, mentor you into the skill set that we're looking for. Now, keep keep in mind there are some positions w- within the company that are one for one. You got to be a culture fit and a skill set based on the role. But the the culture piece is is huge, and I would say from a quote unquote leadership perspective, where so many founders or CEOs, in my opinion, get it wrong, is no one works for me. People work with me. In three letters, CEO, that does not make you a leader. I already had two initials in JT. Giving me the CEO title didn't mean shit. That just gave me five more initials. What makes you a leader are the people who allow you to lead them. Just because you, you've you been bestowed this, this CEO or COO, add your C, uh, C-suite you know, letters on there, doesn't make you a leader. What makes you a leader are the the people who allow you to lead them. You know, when it comes to culture fit and interviewing new potential folks, I'm going through that process right now a lot. I've got to hire probably 10 people in the next three months. And that's not something I have a ton of experience doing. My, my businesses have really run lean and mean and on an outsourced basis for the last 10 years. So this is, this is definitely new territory for me. And I've read a thousand times that cultural fit is extremely important, but I would love it if you could share some advice on how to ensure that's the case other than, you know, asking someone, Hey, here's our mission. Do you believe in it? Are, you know, are you aligned with it? Do you like what we do? Okay. You're a culture fit, right? How do you, how do you measure that? So, so a couple of pieces there for, for me, I am a big, uh, our, our tribe will tell you, and I know they get tired of me, me saying this is I, I've built a career out of asking questions meaning there there is not a deep academic skill set here by any means so there there I've built a career out of asking questions what I have also found interesting is I've equally built a career out of listening and so when we do interviews I I well, I'm going to put my my secret out here when, when I say this so many times when people walk into uh, an interview and they're they're prepared, they're sitting down and they're just, you know, they're amped up, they're ready, and they know they're getting ready to be peppered with questions. I sit down in an interview and the first thing out of my mouth is, you and I will role play this. All right, Mike, great to, to meet you. What questions do you have for me? And what that does immediately is it throws the person for a loop because they're not expecting it. They're expected, they're expecting to be asked a ton of questions. More importantly, what I have found is that when you do that, people will tell you who they are by the questions that they ask. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you allow them to ask those questions, and then I ask questions around the information that, that they're giving me. What questions are they asking me? And, and Mike, I cannot tell you how many times I've asked that to someone. Okay, what questions do you have for me? I've had people literally say, oh, I don't have any. I'm blown away by that. So I know immediately, okay, you're not working here. Um, So it's giving people that space to tell you who they are, I I find absolutely fascinating. Well, that's good. That's actually the approach that I've been taking in my interviews recently, which is great because that's the first thing I want to know. Hey, why are you, you know, why are you interested in, in working with this company, right? That's awesome. Great piece of advice. What else can you share when it comes to building an amazing team? Even with the team uh, themselves, I'll g- give give me some some minutes here. If you go to our website, when you go to most companies, and the first thing you see on the about us page is you see the C suite executives. Well, it's opposite with us. It, you got to go to the bottom of the page to find me. And the reason why that is is I find that the people who are actually doing all the work should be showcased. So if you're looking for me by chance. You're going to have to go through all of the, the tribe members long before you get to the bottom of the page to, to see me because those are the people who actually do all the work. Why that's important in building a team is it's not a dictatorship. 
those are the folks who are doing the work. Those are the folks who are on the front lines. I want to ask them questions. You tell me how we can improve. You tell me what are the things that you're seeing that aren't working. So many times, some you know, you, you get leaders or, or executives, they come down from the mountain and they say, okay, this is the mandate, this is what we're going to do. But they're so disconnected with actually what's going on is it's nothing more than a mandate. And so many times it's the wrong mandate. So I'm I'm one who believes wholeheartedly in truly it's a team. It's it's a tribe. Again, no one works for me. People work with me. I sit out in the middle of the floor. You can come up and sit at my desk at any given moment. I'm accessible 24-7. So that's, for me, that's my style of leadership. Maybe it doesn't work for everyone, but that's what I do. Yeah, no, that, that, uh, that makes a ton of sense. You know, when it comes to constantly growing to the point where you guys are now, you know, moving offices for the third time in a row, should people, well, actually, I think the way that you've done it, you know, starting with WeWork is great because one of the biggest questions a new company has when they start to grow is do we go lease an office and then how much space, right? Because if you sign a, a three or five year lease and then just like you guys are out of space in 90 days, what do you do? So, right. um, any What's words? It's, of- fu- it's funny you say that, Mike, because here, here's what I find too. We'll go, we'll go back to our, uh, raising VC money. What's mind blowing, especially here in Austin, Mike, you know this, you've seen it a million one times. Company X goes out and raises $20 million, series A, B, C, whatever, you know, put, put in your, your, your letter and immediately, oh, we got to move downtown to the hotness. We, we got to get the nice building. We've got to have, you know, the, the free lunch every day, all the new cool shit. And do you know your numbers? Why are you doing that? Why, why are you uh, all of a sudden what downtown is going to help you more than when you were on the outskirts uh, of downtown. Why did you why did you make that move? So you you make a great point. Why? And to to sign a 3-year lease when you're growing like crazy, that doesn't make sense. Then now you're trying to uh, you know sublease the the space so you can go to a bigger space. Know your numbers. What are you doing? What are your projections? How many people do you need to hire? How fast is business growing? You should be able to sit and identify these things or at best have people around you that can identify those things. Yeah, absolutely agreed. We we went through that transition and made that mistake six years ago. <laughs> you know, looking <laughs> looking at all the hot hot available spots in downtown Austin and how we were gonna, you know, pimp it out and and uh you know put Art up and fish tanks and all of that good stuff, right? And uh, yeah. you know, and the, the thought behind it is, we want to attract the highest quality talent, and if we're going to do that, we need you know to build out a place where people want to go. And I think that's, I think that's the thought behind any company that does that, whether you're Facebook or Google or whatever. But the difference is, is you know, we're bootstrapping this with cash out of our pocket. We don't have a very long company history. You know, maybe we're 15 months old. We're not you know, three years in. And um, I think you need uh, some more stability there before you, you start to spend like that, if you will, or invest in your business like that. You know, it's, it's, it's to, to jump on that as well, Mike, ask yourself this. If you're attracting people who are attracted to you because you've got the ping pong tables or the basketball court in the back, or you guys do uh, lunch every day or whatever, are those the individuals you actually want to attract or do you want to attract the individuals who are behind your company, your mission, your culture? Those are the individuals you want to attract. And those individuals are not going to be swayed by a ping pong table or beanbag chairs. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the lesson learned, <laughs> you know, so without a doubt. So, JT, you know, one of the things I remember you discussing at dinner that night is – how you give back to your community and to younger kids these days to really inspire them and mentor them. Could you share that with everybody? Yes. One, one of the, one of the three greatest things I've ever uh, accomplished in life, Mike, one, my wife, two, my, my, my children, three is when I was able to bring a group of kids, teenagers, 
who are high risk youth, they, they are trans- transitioning back into society. So they were at a halfway house here in, uh, in Austin, part of the, the juvenile system. And for me, I know when I saw River Oaks, that was life changing for me because I got to see something that I never saw. So I went to the superintendent of the, the halfway house and I said, OK, can I bring these kids to my office? I wanted them to see an office space because I knew none of these kids had ever seen an office because Lord knows I, I didn't. I brought those kids to the office, Mike. It was on a Saturday and we had this massive conference room, two drop down big screens, 11,000 square feet, uh, double screens on all the desks because it was a software company. And the kids just oohed and odd all the way through the, the office and they had never seen what an office looks like. And why that became important to me is because you don't know what you don't know. And now they knew what was possible. Here was a, a person in front of them that had come from where they had come from, but now worked in this office. And they could see, wow, I can be a software engineer. I can work in an office. But if you don't know those things even exist, how the hell are you supposed to aspire to want to be that? And right. so that for me to this day is one of the top three things I, I ever did. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, completely agreed, right? I think that's that's something that's really cool being a car guy and, and loving to race cars. Whenever you know I'm out in the sports car or something and little kids either come up to it or look at it or whatever, they're just super thrilled to – see something that it, they, you know, are inspired by essentially. And the hope is that, you know, as they get older, teenagers or whatever, that's going to inspire them to go out and achieve and, and to do whatever they need to do to, you know, get their car one day. Right. Yep. Much like your, uh, your story of, of driving through, uh, you know, that neighborhood, uh, you know, when you were a child, uh, essentially and how that inspired you. So that's awesome. Well, JT, this has been just amazing. Your your story and what you've done with your life is just unbelievably inspiring. Is there any final piece of wisdom that you'd like to share with everyone today? You know, Mike, if you would give me two minutes, there, there's a couple of things. And life is about mindset and, and choices. And recently, I'm, I'm talking over the, the last month, I'm going to share a very personal uh, story because one, it's kind of therapeutic for me, but but two, it just it shows you how much your past can can impact you if, if you don't do something uh, about it or, or change your, your your mindset. For me, life is all about mindset and choices. So that that that's first. But recently, my my wife asked me. This is going to be way more than people probably want to know. My wife asked me. She says, "Why is it that?" you don't like for me to initiate sex. And I had to think about it. I didn't have an answer at at first. And so here I have this book and it talks about how I was sexually abused, but I realized, yes, everyone knows I'm saying I I was sexually abused, but no one actually knows what happened. And I, I took time to think about it when she asked me that question. And I realized that one of my dad's prostitutes used to make me go down on her. And if I did it wrong, I'm five, six years old. And if I did it wrong, she would smack me in the head and tell me do it right. And at five or six years old, what the hell does do it right mean? And I remember how wow. confused I was. And, and, and I didn't know what to do to do it right. I didn't know how to fix it. Why I share that is because to this day, I do things and I make sure I can find out how to perfect or at least attempt to do them right and and make sure that that I can operate flawlessly. That has hurt me at times because I'm always trying to operate in a perfectionist mindset. And truth be told, there's no such thing as perfection. So the mindset is is everything for, for me in life. It's People ask me, JT, how do you get up every morning at, at 4 a.m.? And, and they'll follow it up with, oh, I'm not a morning person. Well, I tell them, well, you're right, because you just said you're not a morning person. So if, if you have the mindset that you're not, you're not. But everyone can get up at 4 a.m. if you want to. You can go to the gym or you can go to the drive through Life is choices. 
all of the shit that I've been through, Mike, I, I, I don't mean to be arrogant or, or not considerate when, when I say this, but I do believe that we all have the choice to overcome and, and success is actually a little bit easier than, than we make it out to be. Yeah, that's amazing. That's unbelievable. I've got a favor to ask of you, and it's a little—it's a little on the lighthearted side here. So, I'm assuming you know Jocko Willink. I do. You know how he posts uh, a picture on Twitter every morning of his stopwatch at 4:30 in the morning when he wakes up. Oh no, I didn't know he did that. Every morning on Twitter, his whole thing is that he gets up at 4:30, and and the first thing he does is post that onto Twitter for everybody to see, right? Because he's such a big proponent of that. Oh, Can wow. you please take a picture of your watch at 4 a.m. and like tweet to him and say, I've got you beat? <laughs> oh, man, I, w- I would love to do that. I-, I had no clue he actually did that. I-, I had the opportunity to meet him in San Diego, had no clue that, that he did that. But yeah, I would love to do that. that I'll-, I'll hit be, him with a 345. That would be epic. <laughs> just kind of just, you know, CC me in the tweet. And uh, because I'll just I want to give him a hard time <laughs> because that would be awesome. Well, man, that's that's a, an amazing feat in and of itself. I have to ask, when do you go to bed? I go to bed each night anywhere between nine thirty and ten thirty. They're right in that that hour range. But I, I do my best to to try to at least get six hours of sleep. I, I know, and and this has been incredibly uh, flattering for to to hear Tucker and Zach say this. But they said, you know, we highly depend on you. So the number one concern for us is your health and we want you to get more sleep because there's days where I'll only sleep three hours. And wow. so they are always pushing me to to sleep more, take better care of myself. And that's that's such an amazing thing to have two co-founders that give you that type of love and say, look, our number one priority for you is to take care of yourself because we want you to take care of the company. And we want you to be around to, to do that. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I've got to get seven or eight or I'm just a mess. I'm just a mess. So I'm, I'm jealous that you can get up that early. But I was like, I'd have to I'd have to go to bed at eight. And I just don't think that's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know, think, think of it this way, Mike. Like I said, it, it's mindset. It's um, and I won't go too long winded on you here. Someone said to me uh, one time, they said, oh, well, you're going to get burned out. And I said, burned out is a convenience. And they go, what do you mean by that? I go, when people say, oh, I'm burned out, I I, I need a vacation. Well, what if you don't have the means to have a vacation? What about, what if you're that that minimum wage employee who works 40 hours a week for $10 a, an hour, $400 a, a week, $20,800 a year, 52 weeks a year, you don't have the luxury to get burned out, especially if you have mouths to feed. So it, it's all mindset of how you want to approach it. So I guarantee you, Mike, you don't need eight. Let's start and, and start at seven. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on, you know, 630. I've got, um, I've got an alarm now, which... I'm very stubborn about it because the entire reason I became an entrepreneur is to do whatever I want to do, right? And so having an alarm is very uh, is not very aligned with that that attitude. But at the same time, uh, priorities are different these days. So getting up at six thirty, uh, hitting the uh, the Peloton bike, which has been awesome. Nice, and uh, and it's amazing because by nine nine thirty, I've got all my stuff done for the day, like all of my most important tasks for the day. Are done, and by ten o'clock, I'm looking for more stuff to do, um, yep. which is just amazing. So, hey, Mike, awesome. how, how old are you? Uh, just turned forty. Okay, so I'm forty six. So you should remember this. This is for for all your old school listeners. Do you remember the old school army commercial where they used to say, "We do more before nine a.m. than most people do all day"? Sure, yeah. That, that that's how I I treat life. Yeah, and it's it's awesome. It's. The only, uh, you know, the only challenge I have is that's only possible if I am disciplined about the night before. Yeah. You know, if I go out with friends and have a great dinner and some wine, that's not, uh, 630 is not going to happen for me. Um, so, <laughs> um, it's a two part deal for sure. It starts, it literally starts the evening before and how you manage that. So, yeah. Well, JT, you've got a, you've got a book out. Obviously you have to, you have to write a book based on your story, but also the fact uh, that you are the CEO of a, a book publishing company. People can obviously go learn more about uh, Book in a Box at the website, but where can they go pick up a copy of the book and learn more about you? 
You can go to Amazon. Uh, the book's there. It's called I, I Got There, How I Overcame Racism, Poverty, and Abuse to Achieve the American Dream. Uh, you can find out anything you want about me on LinkedIn. And th- those are the easiest places to to find me. Hell, if you email me direct, I'll even email you back. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And, and thank you for the time today. It's been a pleasure. I can't wait to come by and, and see the new office, uh, you know, with you guys. And uh, just for everybody who hasn't, you know, maybe heard Tucker's previous episodes with us, there's a couple of things on the uh, the Self-Made Man platform here coming up in a little bit. We did a lesson with Tucker uh, at his original penthouse office, if you will. So you'll get to see a tour of that crib style if you care to to check that out. It's definitely a phenomenal, phenomenal lesson on the essentially benefits of writing a book and how you should use that to grow your business <laughs> and your brand. And they uh, did my magnetic sponsoring book for me as well. I think two or three years ago, you guys published that for me and put it on Amazon and all of that good stuff. So I am a customer as well as a fan. So thank you guys for uh, what you do. Awesome. Awesome. Mike, I greatly appreciate it. I can't tell you how much uh, I'm, I'm humbled and flattered that you would have me on. So, so thank you, sir. Absolutely. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. As always, if you loved the show, please share it with those you care about. Leave us a review on iTunes. That's how we, uh, we help spread the word. And we really rely on your word of mouth to do that. So thanks again for listening and we'll see you next week.